So, hello everybody. Uh, welcome, thank you for coming to our celebration of Mary Owen Mark and our book and exhibition, Man and Beast, Photographs from Mexico and India. There are a lot of familiar faces here today, so that's always very exciting for us. Uh, but just for you newcomers, could you please raise your hand? We'd li also like to see how many people are here for the first time. Oh, that's terrific. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for coming. And this is kind of informal, but please also find me or one of the staff afterwards to tell us how you like the Sunday afternoon format. We used to do this Saturday evenings. I think we've done one before this uh, in the Sunday afternoon, and it, we kind of like it that way. But please tell us what you think. Um, before I begin, let me recognize some special guests that we have here uh, with us today. Bill Whitliff. There you are, Bill. <laughs> Bill, along with his wife, Sally, uh, is a founding donor of the Whitliff Collections, uh, the brainchild and vision of some now 26 years, uh, and has flowered into what we have today. Uh, and we also have some members of the university's administration. <coughs> we are always so grateful for their presence here. And it's such a powerful symbol of their long-standing support of the Whitliffe Collections. Uh, we are very honored to have uh, to, today the president of Texas State University, Dr. Janice Trout. And the Whitliffe Collections is a special collection in the larger university library, as I'm sure you noticed as you got here today through the, the elevators up to the seventh floor. So let me recognize the head of the university library, associate vice president and librarian, Joan Heath. <laughs> and the library is but one of three departments that make up the Division of Information Technology. And I'm happy to recognize our division's vice president, Dr. Van Wyatt. I also need uh, to thank a few people uh, who have given so much of themselves for the exhibition and the book. Uh, first, I want to thank Carla Ellard, our curator of photography. There you are, Carla. She not only let me arrange this exhibition, and it's been a few years since I've done so, so she, she really should take more credit than I can for the arrangement of this show. She was an invaluable aid, as always. Um, and she also curated the exhibition in what we call the Tile Galleries next door, Coming to Light, which is a recent acquisition show. We'll celebrate that show more formally in the fall, uh, but I want to give a hand to Carla for doing a great job with that show as well. <laughs> the book, Man and Beast, is the latest in our collaborative series with the University of Texas Press. I first want to thank Bill Whitliff again, who initially had the vision to do a book with Mary Ellen. So thank you, Bill. And it's a beautifully done book. I want to extend special thanks uh, to Dave Hamrick, the director, uh, and to Ellen Mackey. I don't think, Ellen, are you here? No, I didn't think so. Uh, who designed the book with Mary Ellen. Credit should also go to Bob Hennessy, who did the marvelous separations for the book, and Chuck Kelton, who created these beautiful prints that surround you uh, today and were used for the book itself. Silver gelatin. Silver gelatin. <laughs> I think we'll talk a lot about silver gelatin today. Uh, but of course, the greatest thanks uh, for the book uh, goes to Mary Ellen herself, who created such an outstanding body of work uh, for so many decades and for whom Man and Beast represents her 19th major solo publication. So thank you. In case you hadn't noticed, we have signed copies available for sale at a special rate just for today. Do not come back later trying to get the special rate showing that you were here. It won't work. You have to buy it today. Let me just go over the program very quickly. It's pretty simple uh, today. I'm going to introduce Mary Ellen more formally, and then she and I will uh, have a chat about her work and her career. Uh, then we'll have some time for your questions. 
and then a reception with food will follow the program. Uh, and Mary Ellen has agreed to do some uh, personalization of books, and we'll do that out in the main lobby at the long table where your name tags were. So it's a tremendous honor for me to introduce Mary Ellen Mark, who's been taking photographs with her unique sense of humanism for nearly 50 years. And I should begin by saying that to truly do justice in describing her career to you, it would take at least half an hour. So I'm going to hit some of the highlights for you today. A native of Philadelphia, she attended the University of Pennsylvania, where she received a BFA in painting and art history and a master's in photojournalism from Penn's prestigious Annenberg School for Communication. After completing her master's, Mary Ellen received a Fulbright scholarship to photograph in Turkey. In 1966, she moved to New York City, where she has been based ever since. As I mentioned before, with the publication of Man and Beast, she has published 19 major solo publications including such landmark books as Ward 81 with Simon & Schuster from 79, Falkland Road, and we'll talk a little bit about that book today, for, with Knopf, 1981, Mother Teresa's Mission of Charity in Calcutta, Friends of Photography, 1985, Streetwise, 1988, University of Pennsylvania Press, then Aperture in 92, Mary Ellen Mark, 25 years with Bullfinch in 91, Indian Circus, a book we'll talk a lot about uh, today, uh, first published by Chronicle in 1993, Exposure by Feigen in 2005, Extraordinary Child, New York Museum, the National Museum, excuse me, of Iceland in 2007, uh, and Prom from Getty in 2012. Her editorial magazine work has featured photo essays and portraits in such publications as Life, New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker, Rolling Stone, Vanity Fair, and a little closer home to uh, all of us, you can see in this exhibition in the back room over there, she's worked with Texas Monthly as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she has had well over 100 solo exhibitions and over 200 group exhibitions worldwide held consistently since 1976. Some of her most important grants have included those from the National Endowment of the Arts, for the Arts, 1977, 79, and 80, and 1990, a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1994, and an Erna and Victor Hasselblad Foundation grant in 1997. She has also received over 60 awards, so if you're counting at home, that's more than one per year since she began photographing more than one per year. Some of the most important recent ones include the Matrix Award for Outstanding Women in the Field of Film and Photography in 1994, and the Eric Solomon Award for Outstanding Merits in the Field of Journalistic Photography the same year. Others include the Infinity Award for Journalism in 1997, the Cornell Kappa Award from the ICP in 2001, the first prize in the arts from the World Press Photo Awards in 2004. And she's not done there. This week, she will travel to London to receive the Sony World Photography Awards Outstanding Contribution to Photography. And then on May 5th, she will receive the Lifetime Achievement Award in Photography from the George Eastman House in New York. So she <laughs> Now, all of these accolades clearly speak to uh, the quality of her work, the merits of her career. Uh, since you're surrounded by nearly 100 uh, remarkable prints of her images uh, today, you don't need or really want me to try to put into words her ability in photography. You can see it for yourself, and these images speak for themselves. But I did want to make sure to mention, because I know Mary Ellen won't do it herself, that she is a tremendously generous person. One of her great legacies, in addition to her own photography, is her extensive teaching and lecture career. She's been teaching workshops for 40 years, by my count, 
lending her students expertise, wisdom, and guidance, and including workshops in Oaxaca since 1996. A little closer to home, again, I'll use that phrase, Mary Ellen has been truly generous with us. All of the images in the exhibition and the book were donated by her to the Whitliffe Collections and Texas State, where they can be studied for generations to come. So please join me in thanking her for that. And finally, just a personal note, I want to thank her for truly moving heaven and earth to be with us here at Texas State today. Please join me in welcoming, yet again, put your hands up for Mary Ellen Mark. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Um, are these turned on? I think so. Yeah. Can you hear Can me? Can you hear her? Yes, I can. <laughs> um, I, well, I, I want to thank, <laughs> a few thank yous. I, I want to thank uh, Texas State University and thank the president, um, Den I shall pronounce Den the name right, Denise Troth for being here and Bill Whitliff for making this happen and, and uh, making the show happen, but also a beautiful book happen. And David Coleman, thank you for everything. Of course. And Carla Ellard for all of your work. And, and also at the University of Texas Press, I, I met the other day Dave Hamrick, who's a fantastic person and, and um, a visionary in, in, in book publishing. I mean, the books they've done are really, so I'm honored to be among their books. Um, and also Ellen McKee, who designed the book mm -hmm. and was a great collaborator, wonderful person to work with. Um, through and through, she was great. Um, I want to thank Chuck Kelton, who, who's worked with me for years. He's a great printer and, and because of the digital revolution, you can get him to print for you if you want. He, he's amazing. <laughs> he's an amazing printer, consistent, fantastic. And Bob Hennessy, who did the separations for the book, and he's done every book I've done. And he's brilliant. He's one of like there are five people that are known to be great separation artists. Very hard to do, and he, and he's a wonderful person too. I want to thank my friends for being here. Um, Michael and Elizabeth O'Brien. Michael's a great photographer, and they're old friends. Elizabeth's a writer, and she's a psychologist now. Really good. <laughs> uh, Prudence Heisler, who's also a psychologist. <laughs> I have a lot of friends with shrinks. Um, and an old friend, a wonderful friend, um, DJ Stout, one of the best designers I've ever worked with, one of the best art directors. She's really a genius, she's fantastic. And, and John Langmore, a great friend and a really fine photographer too. And thank you all, all for coming. And start asking questions. Okay. <laughs> Are there any young children in the audience? <laughs> I guess I should have asked that first. So we're going to, I think, mostly talk about the work that surrounds us here. Uh, but you know, you, you've been going to India for so long. And one of your first uh, projects was, of course, this book, Falkland Road. Um, you first went there in 1968 yeah. and returned several times uh, trying to get in. So uh, I know I've read and heard you speak about how difficult it was to not get to the road itself, but get in into that road and to get those people to open up to you. So can you, I don't know, first talk about how you were able to do that? Well, I mean, in the kind of work I do, access has always been essential to be able to have access, whether you're photographing in a brothel or a circus or just a family. They have to allow you access. And for the first time I went to Falcon Road, it was in 1968, someone took me there and, and I was just really taken back. It was really very medieval atmosphere. It was fascinating and I thought I want to come back here. I have to photograph here. And so finally I was able to convince someone, because in those days, magazines were like grant givers. For me, magazines have been a great source of 
me doing my work, and I always looked at them as, as my grants. But I was finally able in the late 70s to convince someone to let me go back. Mm -hmm. And I knew I had to, to bring back pictures. So I just went there boldly. And the first time, of course, someone stole my address books and it knocked me over. And it, but I went back. I went back and back and back. And people looked out the windows and, and they became familiar with me. And then I started photographing on the street. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, I have to go in the brothels. Yeah. And so I went into a brothel, and of course, same thing, people screaming, running in their rooms. And then I thought, you know, i got to go back the next day, because if I don't come back, they'll think I was frightened. So I went back the next day, and finally I met this woman named Saroja, who was watching me for, it was about a week, it took about a week to get inside, from the street, and she invited me in. And she was a really respected madam, and from then on, things just opened up. So then the word spread that you were okay, that it that was... That Sarita invited me in and, yeah. and I was okay and I was taking pictures. Yeah. And that's sort of how it happened and then more and more and more. And then I wanted photographs with customers and I spread the word and then some were willing. And that, that's sort of how it happened. I was there for every day for three months. Wow. And at one time the police came in to raid the place, and the women hid me. So then I knew I'd really made it. <laughs> you were in. Yeah, I was in. That's tremendous. Well, and we'll look at some other pictures, and I want to talk about that aspect of how you are able to, it's all about access, as you say, but it's also about a rapport, about getting someone to. Well, it's about connecting with people. Yeah. And, it's, and I think you have to do it in your own way. I mean, you can't try and be somebody else. It's about being direct and being honest. At the same time, you're taking a certain control. This is balance of how to be. And I think that often with a lot of these women, no one was ever interested in them before. Mm. So it's interesting how few questions people that I've worked with for years have asked me about myself. The focus is totally on, on the person. Sure. And that was for Geo, is that right? It was fine. It was for Geo, and then when they saw the pictures, they were afraid to run them, so Stern run, ran them. And then I thought, well, I have to make. I had so many photographs. I thought this could be a book, and I, I took it to Knopf. Yeah. And and they took the book. So so Geo is a U.S. publication, and Stern is the German one. So the Germans were able to. But you have to remember be more it, was, it was a different time. Yeah. It was a time it was before the you know the internet. Now people are far, they're less trusting. You know, they all think that they're going to go be seen on, and they say, on the internet, that everyone will know what they're doing. Right. So the world's much more open to everybody. We're much more connected than we were then. Yeah. And this was you know, a, a landmark book for you, and I think still is considered just one of the You'd great. You'd be surprised how it, it's now, like for me, the prints are really beautiful. I've had dye transfers made. And I've had uh, cibachromes, and I have, and but people are like afraid of those pictures still, and that's really shocking to me because for me, I, I really think that it's a unique work. I don't, I've never seen that kind of access before into the lives of, of these women, yeah. and um, I, I don't think it. Maybe it, it's like a little treasure that I'm holding, and maybe. It'll, someone will finally recognize its value. Yeah. We have one copy in an exhibition case over there, but we also have another copy that's available for people, students, the public, whoever, to come look at in our reading room. So It wasn't come back. meant just to be about India. It was really a metaphor for, for women that all over the world that, 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 that sell their bodies to survive. Yeah. And, and Certainly not unique to India. No. Yeah. Before, before AIDS was recognized, too. That's one of the earliest pictures that I took in Mexico. When, one of the f earliest times that I went there, it's taken in Oaxaca, um, and, and when I began to fall in love with Mexico. So I think by my reckoning, you went to India and Mexico for the first time pretty close to each I other. I went to Mexico before, but, but close, within a year or two. Yeah. Yeah. No, actually, I went to Mexico when I was still in college, so five, six years. Okay. 
And, and I don't know if there's students here. I'm not going to break down a lot of photographs here for you today. But I just you know, want to comment. I mean, this is early work for you. And yet the dynamism in this image, the, the way the glances are going back and forth, the way the, the, way the fiddle is pointing at this young girl. I was lucky. Lucky <laughs> <laughs> <Like a> shot. <laughs> I, I didn't, the first time it's been printed in a book is this time. I, looking through old context sheets, I found it. And I think that's, that's not a bad frame for a beginner. So, um, I think it's a pretty damn good photograph for a beginner. So I was going to ask this later, but then, so how is this process? You're doing some, I guess you might call retrospective books now. This is one that, in a sense, looks back. Uh, You've told me your library is very well organized, but what's it like to go back and look at some of these things that didn't make the edits from long ago because they didn't need to make those edits well, you then? Find, you find more pictures when you're looking back to earlier work because now I'm, I think I'm a good editor. That's how I teach, by editing other people's work. But when I, um, now I'm looking through the work that I did with this girl named Erin er Blackwell because we're making a film about her. We, Martin, my husband, made a, a film called Streetwise, sort of based on a, a, a project I did for Life magazine on street kids in Seattle. And there was one girl who was fantastic. And she was a 12-year-old prostitute. And so we followed her for 30 years. And so we did a Kickstarter a, a couple months ago and raised money to go back and make a film and more pictures about her. And we're going to do a, like a book Aperture's going to publish a book that'll be like a retrospective of her and the street kids. Oh, terrific. With new pictures. So I'm going to looking through the contact sheets also for new pictures. Yeah. And I shot her again. And I'm going back, hopefully I'm going to go back again in, in uh, July and work with her again. She has 10 children now. So I have to look through all those sheets to see if I miss something. Uh, the, the last slide I have is of this w girl. So. I'm not going to go all the way through the yeah. PowerPoint well, and then I'll circle back. I'll tell you back, more about her. You'll She's see amazing. Her. You'll see her, I promise. Um, oh, and one thing that's obvious when you really look at the prints, you, you, on a slide like this, you can't really see. This may be lucky, but there's also no cropping of this yeah. image. I'm a purist. I've always <laughs> been a purist. I mean, there are great photographers that crop their pictures. Arnold Newman cropped his pictures. Yeah. I mean, he shot this often a, a square format, and he would but he also shot a lot of 4x5 that wasn't cropped. But, right, right. But um, he, he was a good cropper. He was good. He was <laughs> but an I've, I've sort of grown up with the discipline that you don't crop. And when I teach, a lot of students aren't allowed to crop. Because I think you have to see through the camera. Yeah. You know, it's always better if you can see it through the camera than if you change the dimensions of your frame by cropping it. That's what's so different about this whole new digital world, that things are inserted and stuck in. I come out of the, a world that believes that photography is about finding an image, especially street photography, which mm -hmm. is the hardest photography to do. Mm -hmm. It's about finding an image and capturing it. It's not about inserting all sorts of things afterwards or putting a gray filter or a red filter or a blue filter over the picture to make the color look, look good. I, I don't, I'm a total purist. <laughs> <laughs> and a woman of opinion. That's good. Well, I mean, that way. I think that, that a lot of the new digital work, and my students, most of them shoot digitally. Um, you can do it if you use Photoshop as a dark room. You can, but if when you yeah. start moving things around and changing people and colors and everything, it becomes an illustration. It's not a photograph. Right, right. It's different. So I also have this photograph of yours up fairly early in the exhibition, because I wanna, want students and people to see your work to understand the role of portraiture. It's a very strong role in your whole body of work. So how do you, not how do you decide, but how do you feel? I mean, you think in series and in big stories. How do you blend in, or how do you approach blending in portrait photography? Well, I think of myself as both a documentary photographer and a portrait photographer, but my whole basis from the beginning was the street. That's how I started on the street, capturing yeah. moments. And I still feel the hardest thing is, port is not portrait, but street, to capture something, you know, in one frame. But portraiture is different, but sometimes portraiture gives you a, a certain essence that, that it really works. 
Yeah. And, you know, um, and it's a different approach. In the street, you want to be invisible. You want to be a fly on the wall. Um, with, with portraiture, you take control of someone. It's a certain control that you have to realize, whether it's a very famous person or whether it's, it's a young girl that you meet in, in India. You still, you're controlling, and you have to present that control. Especially with people that are well-known, if they feel that they can't, con you're not under control, they'll, they'll just eat you alive. Control is an important aspect of portraiture. As I'm sure most of you know, Mary Ellen has done a lot of celebrity portraiture. We're, we are not That's showing not any of that today. <laughs> <laughs> we have agreed no, we're not even going to talk about I've that. I've worked on film sets yes. as a way of supporting myself. You know? um, and it's been really interesting work, and I've learned a lot from just watching the lighting camera and work, or, or watching great directors or great actors work. And I've learned a lot and tried to take as much from that, mm. you know, as an education. But you know, I'm not, I, I'm not a celebrity reporter, especially the way celebrity portraiture is today. It's all full of, full of tricks. You know, it's not about the person. Right. It's about the photographer, and, and the more tricks they know, the better. But that, that's what you see today. Yeah. See, Arnold, I think, was a real portraiture, portrait photographer. He really, there weren't any tricks. He just, no. it was beautifully, beautifully executed pictures. Yep. So this print, which is right over there, uh, is the first in the book. So I, I guess I wanted to ask, you know, what... What was it about this image? Well, you know, you've dogs. got man and beast. <laughs> I'm sorry for that poor dog. <laughs> and it was, this was on the steps of the Gats in, in Benares. Yeah. And um, I just was, I was sat there for a while. And then this, this happened. And I mean, that's what's so incredible for me about photography is that something can just happen and you can capture it. And I mean, it, without the. The crawling baby, it wouldn't it'd be just another picture, but you know, I was focused on the dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know you've taken a lot of photographs on the Gats, and it's a very sacred site. And you photograph not only the families who are with the dead and the dying for the cremation site as it serves, but also of the family members of the people, kind of the staff, I guess I would say, the people working that place. At the Gats. At the Gats. Yeah, I mean, it was fascinating. A lot of those pictures have never been seen, have never been published. I just, you know, have them. Um, it's like I also photographed in, in the morgue in Oaxaca. And I haven't really published those pictures either. Oh, wow. But yeah, I don't know. I think death is something that, that, that's fascinating. It's something that we all have to look forward to. So it, it, it is. It's, it's intriguing. And yeah. it's uh, something that I've looked at. Well, I, when, it, when I was arranging the show, I tried to mix up India and Mexico on, on most of the walls, but I felt that the Gats work was so strong that I pulled most of them and put them over in one corner of the room. There's one image actually over there, uh, but it's, it's a great kind of sense of concentration where you can really try to understand what's well, going I made, on. Well, I got to know a lot of people that yeah. work there, the, the men that, that tend the fires, the men that cut the wood. And also, it was interesting for me, the children that live there, because they, they, they hang out there because their, their parents work there. Yeah. It's like a profession. Right. And so I knew them all. And when I left, I was, interesting. I was leaving, and I said goodbye to them. They said, be sure and come back here when you die. And I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just, it's a profession. It's something that they see all the time. I mean, I have pictures of kids jumping rope, and yeah. there, there are shrouded bodies around them. Very ironic. And I know you've shot, I wasn't planning on asking this question, but I know you've shot in color. And I know the Gats can be a very colorful place. India, India. of course, is a very well, colorful place. I photographed the prostitutes in color simply because it was the only way I could get the assignment. They insisted that they do it for the assignment to go uh, to. Okay. But I'm actually glad that I did it because color was, it's another aspect that you wouldn't expect. And I think the pictures are different because they're in color. And I photograph street performers in India. I, I've done, and sometimes I, I've gotten assignments for color. And when I work for the film companies, mm -hmm. it's all color. They don't even want to look at black and white. Sure. 
But I mean, a color is fascinating. I think it's more difficult to be honest with you than, than black and white because you have to deal with color. Right. Another aspect. But most of the subjects that I picked to do work better in black and white. And so that's, the color wouldn't add anything to them. Right. I, I picked this just because of the amazing composition. <laughs> and we're not going to talk again a lot about composition, but it, you lend such vitality to what is an already extraordinary image by really tilting that camera and see and the he ground. He was walking just... pretty fast. I had to <laughs> <laughs> right after that picture, I think he had a little flash. It was shot with a, a small 645 camera. And, and I. He saw it and he freaked out and ran. So they were chasing after him, but you know, <laughs> he was going pretty fast. And, and this is not you falling down, taking a picture, you know, no, as you, no, as no, you no, go. No, no, no. I just, <laughs> he, he, I wanted a picture of him. Well, it's extraordinary with all the amazing lines crisscrossing everywhere. And then the squiggly ropes on the bottom. That's India. It's in, I think it's in Jodhpur, maybe. In yeah. India. So, again, you photograph What's in your diaper? a lot of children. Um, there's an, an, uh, the cliche, of course, is the innocence of children. And a lot of your images, I think, touch upon that. But, or is that just me? I don't, I don't necessarily think of children as innocent. I think of them as little adults. And so <laughs> I try and look at them like, like little adults. I mean, I don't have children. I mean, I never wanted children, actually. I don't think I could have had, you know, mm. been able to travel as much and right. if I had had kids, because it's a huge responsibility. But I, I try not to, I don't want to take cute pictures of children, because I don't think they're so cute. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they can be very, they can be very cruel. They? They bite. I <laughs> <laughs> like chimpanzees. <laughs> No, the chimpanzee bites hard. <laughs> Use your fingers. Well, I think all, uh, speaking as a parent, I certainly know children can be quite cruel to each other. <laughs> that, is, that is for sure. Um, That's what's been so interesting about going back and photographing, although I've been going back for 30 years, but at this point, with this woman that has 10 children, yeah. is to see the dynamic. Yeah. That's Pinky. That's Pinky. So I think we're going to stick a little bit on this image for a while and have you talk about the circus in India. Um, you, as you wrote in Indian Circus, you first went to the circus when you first went to India and you were drawn back again and again. Well, because India is such an insane place. You could imagine what the circus is like. It's such an imaginative country. And so the circus is more imaginative than any circus I've ever ever seen. Yeah. It makes the Cirque du Soleil look like, like nothing. But <laughs> yeah, it does. I mean, well, there was this one man practicing one day. I'm standing on his head, and there was no net. And he was standing on his head in a really high row. And I said, what happens if you fall? And he said, death comes. So I mean, it's that kind of attitude of, of daring, but also the imagination of, of the different acts. And, and so it was, it was a fantastic experience to spend all those months going back to the circus. And actually, it was, it was a grant that I got from, from Kodak, from right. Ray de Moulin, who was this, this wonderful man that really had felt that, you know, your products, if you want to sell your products, you hire photographers who are going to do great work with the products. People don't necessarily think that way anymore. No. Yeah, that has really changed. Totally. That has really changed in the world. So that's Pinky. We so followed her for a, for a while. And, and these circuses are nomadic, right? I mean, you're trying to f follow well, them or at least know where they are in a certain city and at a certain And they're very secretive day. about where they're going. Very secretive because they don't want another circus to go near there, you know. They, they, so it's very hard. Sometimes we had to wait till the last minute to know where we were going to go. Wow. I mean, in Benares, I remember we went to it. We went all the way to Benares and then we went and the circus was gone. Well, you know, the, the tent was gone. We could see all the marks, but we missed it. Yeah. But you were, so then you were there for about eight months photographing 14, I was there, actually, I made, I made a couple of trips. So yeah. I was there about six months. So this image to me is definitely one of my favorites. The, 
the wall uh, that we have behind here. Uh, you see, it's a street photograph in a way. It is a street photograph. Now, I wanted to ask you, and there's other images in, of Pinky, and we'll talk about Pinky in a moment, but one of the images that was published in Indian Circus, it, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, is this one, which must have been shot at the same time. Let me go back. She, she's wearing the same thing. It, it's either shot at the same time, or it's that I knew that before they went performed, that's where they would line up. Yeah. And I would go back to that spot. So they're practicing. They're yeah. simply, simply practicing and just waiting. And then, then she's supposed to stop practicing. And then things sort of change. Someone walked by in the frame. And well, that's, and that's what I love. I think I have a point. She's still practicing. It's probably the <laughs> and same she's still time. practicing here. Yeah. But then this man walking through it just yeah. kind of makes it really magical, I think, to me. So let's, I guess let's talk a little bit about Pinky. Um, you said you followed her around, uh, her well, and I'm her trainer. Well, I first met her when she was younger than that. This is a second or third trip back. And she was really tiny. And she was so beautiful. I mean, she just, you just couldn't take your eyes off her. But she was not only beautiful, she was wise. Martin made a, a film about this troupe. Mm -hmm. and. You just see she's like wise but beyond her years. She had this incredible quality. I mean, people that, are, it's not just movie stars that are stars. It's people that you just meet on the street and she was a star. And we, we, we did, we, we followed her and uh, we even found out where she was from for the film and met her mother. Her mother sold her, was renting her to the circus and we went to the town that, that where she was from. Right. Right. And, but then also you uh, photographed her trainer, who's a mentor. Right. Well, Pratap Singh. Pratap Singh. Was, is her trainer. She lived in a tent with like 10 other girls because people would never sell a, a son or rent a son in India. Because sons are valuable. Girls are not, from very poor families, are not as valuable. So uh, and we, we've, we worked with him. and. Then we heard she was getting married, he had married her off. He actually, at some point where they were driving to another circus, a couple years later, he had an, an automobile accident and her sister was killed. And then he, he, got very, he decided he was not going to work with the circus anymore. He went back to Madras, where he was from, and he, she worked in a beauty salon. And, and she was like, you know, she would ride, she, she gained weight, of course, because she was so thin from, Right. Being an acrobat, right? And she would ride on her bicycle to work with a well, baseball cap on. I mean, I, I never saw her during that part, but I had someone go there and check her out. We heard she was getting married, and so we were going to come back and film her wedding. And then, um, Prachab tricked us. He was a very tricky guy, because he didn't want us to be at, at the wedding because he was afraid we'd tell the the people that that she was married that she had been in the circus. So she got married and we oh. were there. And Martin's never spoken to him again. He sends us his desperate emails of, where are you? And he just, but he kind of betrayed us. Yeah. So Pinky, I guess, had worked through her indenture, her time, her contract. No. She just left. She was able to leave somehow. Well, he married her off. Oh, uh, okay. He, he, it's an arranged marriage. Okay. And he probably, I don't know what the dowry arrangement was, but right. he didn't want us to reveal that, that she had been a circus before. So, I mean, that's one of the fascinating things and somewhat upsetting things about the way the circuses get their labor or their talent, well, I guess there, you could you say. Well, there are a lot of, some of it's very secret. I mean, this is road through Nepal that no one quite understands how it's done, but it's, some of those girls are sold as prostitutes and then some of them are sold into the circus. And then there are families that come from Absolute, absolute poverty. Right. That 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 rent the, the child to the to the circus. Each little tent has maybe ten ten girls. And I and I know that was Pinky's situation with her sister, uh, and Pinky was like three or something. When her mother sold her. Extremely young. When her mother sold her off, to the circus. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And her sister, uh, huh? It's unbelievable. Well, she came from such poverty. You can't imagine. Yeah. In a way, you think maybe it was a better life for her because she was living in an environment that was clean. She was getting 
Patel's wife was a fantastic cook, fantastic. She's been taken care of with her mother. I mean, it was just it's incredible poverty, one that you can't imagine. Yeah. So the mother would make her perform on the street in the village. You no, know, it's better for her. I remember in some of the quotes in the book, Pinky talking about her mother beating her uh, as Possible. well. So, I mean, it, and that's what I tell students when they come through the exhibition because life is complex and photography is complex and these stories are complex. You can, the, the Indian uh, Supreme Court, you know, forbade circuses from uh, hiring this extremely young labor and basically applying the child labor laws to the circus, which they had always looked the other way for the longest time. Well, it, it's very complicated. But it's very In a way, it's child labor, but yeah. in another way, I mean, the mother, you know, the, her other sister, the mother was, was using her as a prostitute in the village. So I, you know, you, you have to look at, maybe she was lucky because, yeah. and then she he took her and he had it provided a dowry for her. You'd have to provide a dowry for her to this family. Yeah. And so, I mean, so whether the guy she married, if she cared about him, I don't know. But I mean, I don't, I'm trying to imagine what her life, she loved performing. She was really talented. She loved performing. She, she loved her job. Yeah. She was a little star. So then, and we won't dwell on this too long, but, you know, from people to animals and the treatment of, not only the performers, but also the animal performers. The cliche, in some ways, is, and justifiably so, a lot of animals are very mistreated in lots of circuses all over the world. But, you know, your, your images, there's, this is one, and I'm, I'm not even well, he's training him saying that's cruelty, up. but there's well, he's only. He's training him. But the thing is that, I mean, animals needed, I mean, I, I think. I never did these pictures to be political, to say, I mean, I did them because I wanted to show the world of the, the circus performers and circuses yeah. inhabit what they do. But, you know, the animals were treated extremely well, I have to say, fed very well and treated well because that's their livelihood. And, and um, they're very expensive, the animals, incredibly expensive to get them. I mean, there's a big movement now in, in the States and also in India. It's very hard to find a circus now with an animal. But, you know, yeah. there are several sides to it. It's complicated. It, it is complicated. It, it's great. In Indian circus, if you don't know the book, Mary Ellen has lots of quotes from conversations with people. And, and you get multiple sides about differing opinions of the people in the circus toward the animals very loving uh, on one hand and very much, you know, y you got to beat them. <laughs> uh, so well, it's complicated. Well, Ringling Brothers, I have to beat them. Oh, absolutely. You know, it, that's part of training a wild uh, animal because it's a wild animal and it will kill you. Right. I mean, most, most trainers of chimps don't have, are missing at least two, three fingers. So that's a good segue to... Raja. Raja. Talk, talk about Raja. I met Raja as a, as a, as a baby. And um, when I first went to India, so and Roger's job was to wheel a, a pram around. I have a picture, but it's not in this, with these pictures, of Roger, you know, wheeling a pram of, with a bit, little child in it around. He would go around the circus ring, and um, he looks very humiliated. He hated that job. Because I don't think he liked the child. But anyway, that's basically. So I saw him again, and he remember. I swear that this is, sounds like you think I'm crazy, but he remembered me. And he, you know, he really, this is Mary Ellen, you know. <laughs> but he looked at me, and he remembered me. And from that moment that he saw me, every time I'd walk into the circus, he'd clap his hands. And I'd have to go over to him and scratch him and, and you know. Give me a kiss, and you know he, he really he, he knew me. And the day I was leaving, the, the trainer was was angry at him, and the only way he could ever punish him was to bring an elephant around. He was frightened of elephants, so he even brought the elephant around and just the cage. You know, and he would see a big elephant, it was terrifying. But he wasn't going to let me say goodbye to him. And Roger knew I was leaving, and he was very upset. But I went and said goodbye anyway. And that's Ram Prakash Singh in Shyama. Um, so talk about, again, I think... A, it's a portrait. It, it's a portrait. But you know I've something... Seen, I've seen people interpret this It's been look, copied a lot. Uh, 
as, you know, I'm, I'm going to get you. <laughs> you know, see, now, I mean, that's a real look. Anyone could do that to, to an elephant size digitally now. So anyway, what, what makes that picture is the look of the elephant. And the thing is that when I came to photograph the trainer, who was very vain and, you know, a real, you know, he was, he was the ringmaster. Yeah. He um, showed me all the things he could do. And one of the things he showed me was he could put his trunk around his neck. And I thought, well, that's great. I'll do that. And I shot a few rolls of film because I, there's a flash fill in this yeah. picture. And um, so I wanted to make sure I had everything right. And I think the elephant had had enough. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the picture. It, it's pretty. I have one of him trunk around me too. Yeah. It's heavy. It's, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> That's in Benares. So we'll go back. It, so yeah. is this in the this Ganges is, this at is the in Ghats? The, on the Ganges, on, on the burning um, gas. Yeah. And if, I guess the boy's father it, it has died. Yeah. And the, the heads are shaved. So, you know, he's in the water and the head was shaved. It's, uh, it's a work as I was looking through trying to learn more about your work as I was laying out the show. I only did see it in one of your other books, the portrait book. It's not really well known. It's, and I think it should be. It's a, s a stunning photograph and the way the water and the light on the water just kind of blends to it's the sky. With Hasselblad. I shot a lot with the Hasselblad with the surface. <clears throat> A digital camera couldn't do that. Different. It looked different. It would, yeah. I mean, I have a monochrome. I'd like it gave me a monochrome. I haven't really used it yet, but it's still as good as it is. That's about as good as it gets. It's beautiful. It's different. It just looks different. The, the range of tones is different. It's just, yeah. there's something for me. And I, I think, I'm thinking, well, what if I went out with my monochrome and I saw something fantastic and I didn't have a camera with film in, with me? So I just, all my archive is in this film. It's very, I think it looks different. But it, it's, I, I'm not putting digital down. I've seen some fantastic photographs from my students that are done digitally, and they're really beautiful. But my work is about film. So at yeah. this point in my life, I don't know whether it's so wise to, to switch. You I, you're doing pretty well, I think you should. <laughs> you can still get film, doing. and I still have fantastic printmaker like Chuck. Yeah. And, and so, and I can still, you know, the problem is, is repairing cameras because, of, you know, yeah. it's finding places that can, when they're not used, that they, they break down. The print of this is really stunning. It's just on the other side of this barrier. I don't know if you've seen it. And w yes, Carla, I'm going to tell the story. So when we had our lighting guys come in and light the show, mm -hmm. they fell in love with this photograph. And they put, I don't know, 10 lights <laughs> on it. And it was incredible, the amount of drama. And his, the whites in his eyes just literally glowed. You could see it from across the room. And I <coughs> had them change it, fortunately or unfortunately, for what you might, opinion might be. Uh, but they were just, it was amazing. And only a silver print, you know, that that print. good could it do is. that. I mean, I've seen some beautiful digital prints and pictures. And, but it's, I think you have to be true to who you are. Yeah. It's really important, and no matter how much pressure, and believe me, there's a lot of pressure. But that's in Mexico, Nino Financia. This is this like very strange festival in Mexico. Um, the, the people, the poorest of the poor go, are ripped off there, let's just put it that way. They go there to worship a guy who died in, in, I think in the late 20s, early 30s, who spoke in a very, he was probably a, a, a transvestite or a transsexual, <laughs> She had a very high-pitched voice, and they feel they can go into a trance and take on his voice. It's very bizarre. But it, at this place, they have a big mud pit where they, it's like a holy baptism, and mm -hmm. they all go in there. So I had to go in there, and, uh, and you know, I, at the end, of, I mean, I had this pair of jeans, and I would stand them up at night, you know, <laughs> because they were so full of mud. So you're in the mud here? I'm in the mud. I was standing above them. I had to go because I was first. I thought I don't want to go in there. It's filthy, but but I I realized that I wouldn't get any pictures if I didn't go in there. Oh, it's wonderful! Really wonderful. This is a great assignment. One of the nicest, one most wonderful assignments the DJ gave me it was for for Texas Monthly. It was on 
rodeos in Texas, and I spent a month working on it. And you know, you have a few assignments in your life that really stand out, and this this is one of them that, that, that really did. It was a fantastic. It was a, we were talking about it before. It was a whole month just to to photograph. <coughs> We, I don't know how many rodeos. Was it about 12? 14. 14. And it was just fantastic going all over Texas. And we did a lot of research. And, and mm -hmm. you know, little towns, big towns. And these are uh, bull riders, young bull riders. It's a, it's a great story. I've got all the spreads uh, for that story. And then also your uh, later one on the Mexican circus in the cases over there. So that, that was also for DJ. But you know, it's interesting because not only was it great assignment and great to work with DJ, but the results were great. So often you do assignments and then you look at the way they're laid out and you just think, oh my God. But he's a beautiful designer. So he really does justice and, and justice to, to what you were trying to do. So that was. Thoroughly great experiences, but thank, thank you for that now. I got pictures for myself from it, and that's what you right, look for, right. is to get images for yourself out, out of, that really are going to last. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. it's not shot in four by five. And, it's, you know. and this has become one of your more iconic images, I would say. Well, that's what you want to have, a, you want to try and make an iconic image. I don't even know what an iconic image is, but that's what you strive for. Well, it's an icon, it's what yeah. students of photography up. worship, right? It's an icon. This was 91. Remember there was this big event in Texas for the, for the book, DJ, there was a yeah, book. Yeah, uh, Texas book. And that was maybe seven years later, and they came this like okay. huge, <laughs> what, what year was anniversary it? anniversary of Texas Monthly. What year, what year was it, do you think? Yeah, 1999, I think. So it was like nine years later, and there were these huge, handsome, still bull riders that came. Yeah. That, these, these kids. Oh, wow. That's the most dangerous sport I've ever seen. It's more dangerous than anything possible. It was, I couldn't watch it often. Yeah. 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 So you wanted me to ask you about Oaxaca. Oh, so I Oaxaca. have. Clown with his oh, baby. Yeah, see, that's a Mamiya 7 camera. Look how like, the quality of the lens is amazing, isn't it? Do you know the Mamiya 7? They make a 6. They don't make either of them anymore. They stopped me. I, as soon as I heard they stopped buying the 7, I was going around finding backups. So, But it, it's a wonderful camera. It's like a big Leica. Yeah. And um, it has incredible quality, the lens. It's all sharp. It's a bit, tw tw you know, the baby doesn't look sharp, but it's all this incredible, yeah. crisp quality. The prints over there on that wall. That's so a you, seven. You can also. see, yeah. The 50, 50 lens is great. But that's in the square in Oaxaca, the main square. And they have a lot of these guys that, you know, dress up. They're, they're terrible clowns. And usually clowns <laughs> overdo it. But, um, that's in Oaxaca. And yet, and so you have returned again and again and again. Well, but I hardly have a chance to photograph there because I'm teaching. It's really almost impossible when you're teaching to, to take pictures because it's like your mind is split. You know, you have to be really focused. On, but sometimes I've stayed a few days after and sometimes I've stayed, I've gone to a couple events with the students, so I usually don't do that. Right. And or came a few days early. So I don't have tons and tons of images from there, but I've managed to get a few. Like I went to the slaughterhouse, that's the pictures here, and, mm -hmm. and I couldn't go inside. I, I couldn't, I just couldn't enter when I was there. But I, I thought, well, I'll make a portrait, and so I went around back, and they had this embryo yeah. of a cow. Yeah, and that's on the back yeah. wall. So well, I put this up. Students work. So, you wanted to make sure we talked a little bit about yeah. your workshops. So this is, we did a few years back, uh, we did a book of 15, when it was 15 years, it's 20 now, that I've been teaching there. We collected pictures from students. And except we, at that point, when they started, there weren't any, you know, we didn't have like, like uh, internet so much or whatever, and how to find them. But we found a lot of people and put together a book of, of the work from, from 15 years, and now what we do from each class. And you can see, if you go on my website, the blur book from the last class. The last class was fantastic. People from all over the world, but the work is really made. And most of it is digital. I'd say about 
uh, out of 18 students, maybe six are shooting analog. But the, the digital work is great also. It really is. And we put together a blur book for each class. But this was just the work. Does it page through or no? No, I just did oh, this okay. one spread. This is just, you know, this is, is that James's picture? That looks like it's James. It, no, it's not. There's this family that James Carbone, who's one of the students, he's a wonderful photographer, lives in, in Pasadena. He's followed them for, for years, but someone oh, went wow. to, this was a while ago, because their yeah. kid's a teenager now. But, you know, just the pictures are really, they've managed to take some wonderful pictures. And it's very rewarding to see yeah. that, that happen. Yeah. You try, the ideal of the class is to try and make people better photographer when they leave. You know, so I have people that are professional, great photographers, and then some people that are beginners. Well, and you made a comment to me yesterday, which I thought was pretty amazing and, and revealing. You said, <coughs> it's easy to get somebody to take a better picture. That's not hard. What's hard is to get people to take great pictures. <coughs> but for, to, to get people to take good pictures, if, if they're willing to work with you, you can, you can teach almost anyone, if they really want to, to be good. Yeah. Great's another thing. Yeah. That, yeah. That's another jump. Can't years. be taught. But I've had people that are really amazing in the class, and really talented, yeah. that have made great pictures. And the last image, I just wanted to allow you to talk a little bit more about Tiny. Tiny. So that's, she looks very different today. I mean, she's had 10 children, and she's put on a lot of weight. And she's, um, She's had a tough life. The first five children were with tricks, so they all have different fathers. Some of them know their fathers, some of them don't. The last five, she's been married to a guy named Will, who I like, actually, but she's really tough on him, you know. And um, so she has five children with him, and they range from, in age from five years old, to Lisa, who is a dobe, and I was her favorite, I have to say. <laughs> she's like, <laughs> She's really cute. She looks like a little tiny. To uh, the oldest, uh, who I saw born, um, who's 28. Wow. And I wow. saw him born. I saw him, you know. And he's not doing so well. The, oh, the, sec the first batch of kids, except for one, that managed to marry a, a basketball player, and she was the most beautiful one and, the, and the, sort of the toughest one, she's doing well. Hmm. The little ones, let's see. I don't know. Well, listen, we, I think we have a little time for some questions from you. We're going to move, hint, hint, the microphone up here. Thank you, Steve. It's, it was, it's great to go back. I think part of being my pictures that I think is to go back. And, with, and keep with, up. It's fascinating. And that's so remarkable and wonderful and atypical for photographers to Going Return back, to subjects like, again and again. I mean, again, it's like we never left. I mean, but yeah. over the past 30 years, I've made several trips there. But we went. This is the longest distance that I it was like eight years that I hadn't seen her. Yeah. And it was like we just started to work immediately. And all the kids, like they think of me as their family. Even uh, to Lisa, I never knew before. Yeah. You know. Amazing. Yeah, it is. It's really interesting. Would anybody like to ask a question? If so, please. Line up. Uh, can we come up here? Maybe come in and speak into the mic. Thanks. Um, as far as the digital goes, to me, it, it doesn't look real. Well, I beg your pardon. You have to talk about it. As far as digital goes, yeah. um, it, to me, it doesn't look real. It always looks surreal. Whereas with negatives, to me, that's more of a natural, a natural look. So in your classes, and you have people t uh, shooting both digital and then negatives, how do you overcome, what is it that you're trying to teach them? Since you, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, taking pictures is you're, it's having an eye. And, and the machine is just a machine. So with a digital camera, you can, if you have an eye, you can take great pictures, too. The look is different. I agree with you 100%. But that's my look, because I shoot in film. But their look can be shooting digitally, and, and basically, the rule is that they can't crop, and they can, if they're going to use Photoshop, it's used as a dark room. It's basically used the same way you'd use a dark room to make a print, not to sort of filter things or change things or work on things. 
So, um, and you can still take great pictures, of course, because it's your mind that's taking the pictures. That's just the machine you're holding. And it could just be the way I perceive the, the end result nope. of, of a, a digital print it's versus a negative print, because I don't, I see that the negative is more real it has a different range and a yeah. different it's grain different. quality. I think in color, digital, I've seen some really, I think black and white is not quite there yet, but in color, I've seen some beautiful, beautiful digital it's prints. Liquid. To me, it's yeah, liquid it can grass. be very rich. But I don't know, I just think you have to sort of be true to who you are. And even with all the, I mean, a lot of magazines don't hire me anymore because I shoot analog. So but it's okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh. You don't have to run, please. Safety first. Uh, forgive me, I came late, so if you've already covered this, um, I drove in from Austin, but are you doing all your own printing as well? You're not printing your own. You're, you no, have a printer. No, I've, I've worked, I learned how to print in the beginning, but I, you know, I, I don't have the talent that my printer has at all. It's, a di it's another process, printmaking, and I mean, Chuck is just a fantastic printer, and no matter how hard I worked in the darkroom, the, the prints wouldn't look like his prints. What's great about him is he's so consistent, and, and uh, you know, he, he's a fantastic printer. But I did learn how to print, so I mean, I know what, but he knows what I, what I want. There's not, I don't think the pictures have changed much. I, my, my goal is always to give him a perfect negative. Right. So I'm always working to, I'm, right. my negatives are really good. <laughs> they are, you have to be furious at me if they're not. So I know how to expose film. That's one thing I think that's happened with, with digital is that, that in a lot of the, the universities or schools, whatever, that teach photography, when you have a basis in film, you know how to, you, you learn how to expose. Exposure sh shouldn't be the, the job of your camera. Mm. I always think, I mean, I, use a, I still use a light meter, and then I make it, I look at what I'm shooting and make a decision mm -hmm. about where, I'm, or I use a lot of flash fill, mm -hmm. and I decide how much to put in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and how long have you had your printer, Chuck? How long have you used him? Film? Chuck, no, no Chuck. Chuck. Oh, Chuck. Chuck. Um, well, I, I, at least like 15 years, because I had an, another person I worked with before that, a woman who was also great, but she retired. And um, I think, you know, Chuck loves printing as well, as well as this woman did too. And a lot of times printers really resent printing. They really want to be a photographer. So, but Chuck, I mean, well, Chuck takes pictures too, but he also loves making, he loves the challenge of printmaking. Thanks. Sure. We can send contact info for Chuck if you... Well, wait, he's like, you know, I think you have to be at a certain level to go print with you, but <laughs> you give him bad negatives. Certain level, please. You have yes, to make great speaking negatives. To the... One question I probably should know, but early on you had the, the fires of Gat over in India. What is that? I had what? The burning guts. What is oh, the burning guts. I'm what sorry, I should have explained. In Benares is a, is a city where people go, uh, Hindus go to, to die, to be cremated on the, on the banks of this river. There's a certain spot, and then it's called the Burning Ghats. But there are Ghats all along in Benares that aren't Burning Ghats, where people bathe and where things are sold. But there's a section called Burning Ghats, and that, that's like a funeral section of, of, uh, of Benares. And you have to go through the, I had to go through the government to get permission to shoot mm. there. But um, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating place. It, and, you it's, know, a, it's a place where people, yeah. they're, they're cremated and then the ashes are thrown into the, into the river. And if you're a priest, your body's thrown in, or a baby, your body's thrown in. Yes, you're not cremated. So families will bring, what, They'll People bring the, who are old and sick will move there so that they they die there, or families will there. bring someone that's that's passed away there, yeah. and ride them there on a bicycle on the back of a bicycle. It's kind of a very different attitude towards death. Mexico also has a very interesting attitude towards death. It is different. Hello, I admire your work a lot. I Thanks. Appreciate you being here. Um, so when you're out on an assignment, you're traveling and. 
when you have a certain subject matter in mind and you're getting there and as you're photographing, it's, it's changing before you and, and the story or the narrative that you initially thought would be there isn't there. Um, how, do you, how, how do you approach that and how have you, like has that happened? Well, it's interesting because in the past, I've had certain assignments given to me that don't exist. A writer, has, a writer has gone to a place and invented a story. <laughs> and, and it happened a couple, one about chemicals flowing into a river, which was absolutely, whether the plant chemicals were flying and all the people that were damaged by them, I couldn't find one person that was damaged by them. So you're, you're in a bad situation. <laughs> and, and then the other was about but that's a good drugs in, in, in Ocean City, New Jersey. And I couldn't find the dealers or people saying anything. Everything was totally fabricated. So I just, at that, the other was in Indonesia, where I was, and now I was sent to do a story that didn't exist. But what I try and do is just go, then I just go out and take pictures. <laughs> you know. You're there. I'm there. And, and so I just try and do the best and say, listen, this story didn't exist, but I'm coming back with these pictures. So you try and make the best of a, of a stupid situation. <laughs> well, that's a really good question. Anybody else? And it's, what's odd is then you try and call the writer, and for some reason, he never calls you back. <laughs> 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 You said he, it's always Well, one, he, one always story this. for Life magazine, I'll never forget this. It was about this woman that was supposed to be incredibly good-hearted, that was blind, that took in all these children. Was that when you were there or no? And, and she's kind and good-hearted. And so we went there, and there was this blind woman. She was blind, and she did take in a lot of children, which she got money for. And she was... Um, she, she would torture them. She was horrible to them. <laughs> and um, there, there's a syndrome called by proxy. What is it? It's, it's Munchausen. Munchausen by proxy. So I figured out this woman has Munchausen by proxy. She was like making all the kids sick and everything. So she got all the attention. She was actually nuts. And I went back and I said to the magazine, you can't run this story. I took pictures. And, and, you know, and I said, you can't run this story. It's, it's a complete lie. And, and they ran it anyway. Oh, no. See, you found out, yeah. find out things. Yeah. Wow. I remember I gave her my card, and I thought, I don't want her to have my card. She's blonde, but still someone <laughs> read her. So I snuck back in the house, and she played solitaire. She was nuts. She was playing solitaire all the time. And I tiptoed in the living room, and I took my card <laughs> off the table. <laughs> I think that might be a good note to end on. <laughs> Please thank Barry Ellen Thank you very much.